Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Great. Big win tonight for the Edmonton Oilers in overtime. 3-2 over the Montreal Canadiens, the hated Montreal Canadiens. Actually, (laughs) that's... I don't know. That's a funny team. Anyway, we'll get into that. The orders, when it came to grade A shots, it was 20 to 7 for the Oilers, but that was really pumped up at the end by um, some Oilers power plays. Six minutes of Oilers power plays right at the end of the game when they got, I think, eight grade A shots, if I'm not mistaken here. So it was a little closer than that. The five alarm shots, the subset of five alarm shots was six to two for the Oilers. So, um, Bruce, this is our Two Good Things, Two Bad Things, Two Numbers podcast. What is your good thing? Yeah, a good thing is getting all those power plays. I think that was a big, big deal. But uh, finally yeah. converting one after having a fairly tough time with the power play for much of the game. But the winning goal, I might as well start with that. Uh, the decider, when they got a four-minute power play with, 28 seconds left in regulation and it took them three minutes and 45 seconds to finally find the net and they, they came close a couple of times but the uh, the game decider uh, was really just a couple of really elite plays from Connor McDavid uh, who uh, uh, there was one Leon shot that went wide and went into the corner and it popped over McDavid's stick and looked like it might go out of the zone and he just ripped back after it picked it up and he made this beautiful little saucer pass like there was a montreal guy coming in on him he just lobbed this this pass over that guy's stick and it just floated through the air landed flat landed on nurse's stick and meanwhile mcdavid is beaten that montreal guy and broken back into the slot so nurse does the correct thing and immediately feeds it right back to him coming into the slot And as the Montreal defense sort of collapses in terror around McDavid, he he finally gets the lane he's been looking for to slip one over to Drysaddle on the uh, Drysaddle spot. And Leon, after a couple of misadventures early, absolutely buried the executioner's shot, rippled the twine and ended the game. So that little sort of eight-second sequence is... uh, uh, my good thing. It was pretty good. Connor McDavid, the master of improv. Mm. Miles Davis of hockey, the genius. <laughs> it it the it, he's done this a few times in recent games where he just kind of suddenly explodes. Mm. He throws yeah. himself at the game. He he just wills himself to win the game and does whatever it takes. And in that case, it was just hustling to win that puck on the boards and then throwing that wild pass to nurse you know through the air charging at the net and setting up um leon dry it was we're so lucky bruce to be able to watch this yeah. player in edmonton we are blessed hockey fans in the city twice blessed wayne gretzky and now Connor mcdavid plus all these other fantastic players assembled around both of the players but it's just such a. It is a. It, we we've been given the uh, the gift of all NHL fans. I guess Pittsburgh might be in the contest with Lemieux and Crosby, but uh, I'll take the two that we have, and uh, smile well, all and the a way. Few to the others, rink. Too. Like yeah, and a few others too. Yeah, both Pittsburgh and Edmonton had terrific supporting casts around the For transcendent sure. star. At least um, certainly the the Pittsburgh Stanley Cup teams did, and and. Edmonton Stanley Cup teams did, and this team certainly has a few very nice pieces around McDavid. It's getting there, and this brings me to my good thing. Bruce, one of those pieces is Matthias Ekholm. And I think whatever was ailing him, I guess it was a hip pointer at the start of the year. A lot of a lot of guys got injured in that captain skate, I feel. I, I think the owners were too fanatical at the start of the year. They all went into the captain skate, and, the, and a bunch of them, a few of them got hurt. I think because they were just so keen to win the Stanley Cup in September that they burned themselves out 
uh, at that um, at those practices. Anyway, um, Ekholm start of the year a little bit slow, but is he ever moving well now? And is he ever slinging that puck around? And when you think about the trade that got him here for a the lowest of first round rep draft picks 32nd overall Reed Schaefer and then another low draft first round draft pick um, for a guy that had three three years left on his contract plus they got him for an entire playoff season so they're going to get him for those three years plus four playoff seasons that was a heck of a trade because I and I bet you Nashville wishes they hadn't made it now because they're a playoff team and they could they could probably use Matias at home but um and the order's got a little cap retention there too, as I recall. So he is just flying out there right now. He's making plays all over the ice. He's defending like a demon. He he's passing the puck. He's looking to score. He almost scored in overtime on his own good chance beside the net. Um, and he and um, on yeah. was it the um, first goal? He pinches in, makes the play, pops the puck to McDavid. And um, a goal is scored. Um, <laughs> I'll say. Um, that was the um, McDavid goal. And then on the next one, he gets a pass from Bouchard. And he makes a really nice feed into the slot to Adam Henrique, who makes a fantastic play in his own right of controlling the puck and putting it in the net. That was a very nice play was by, bullet um, pass, eh? by Janmark, first controlling the puck in the corner, then Bouchard putting the puck across the ice to Ekholm and Ekholm finding Henrique and uh, a goal is scored. Very so brilliant. Ekholm has just been playing. Um, he's one of the, it, he's, he's probably now in the top 50, 20 NHL defensemen, maybe in the top 10. He is, he is playing that well. And Evan Bouchard has also crept into that top 20, I'll suggest, uh, maybe in the top 10. Uh, when you break it all down, this pairing, Bruce, is by far the order's best pairing right now. It has been pretty much all year. Um, Nurse and Cece had a had a had some had a good run for a while there, but they both tailed off significantly. And although I thought Cody Cece actually had his best game, he's had a few good games. He had a really rough September, uh, February, but he's had a now he's he's kind of up and down now. And this he looked I thought pretty good tonight, but Ekholm was just. I just noticed him again and again and again making excellent plays. Yeah, well, he had two assists plus one tonight, and he's now uh, in 84 games in Edmonton, which is barely one season. He's up to plus 59, plus 59 in 84 games. And so, I mean, last year he won the team um, – Emory Edge Award, I'll still call it, with the best plus on the team, even though he only played a quarter of the season. It's amazing. He's plus 28, and then this year he's pouring it on again. He's up over plus 30. And somebody pointed out the other day, the last Oiler to hit plus 30 in an entire season was Craig Muni in 1988-89 when he was plus 43. And there hasn't been a single one since. And, of course, the... the uh, a good team is the one that floats those kind of boats. If you're on a lousy team, you have no chance of being plus 30 and you have little chance of being plus at all. So, you, you know, you really have to parse that statistic through several grades of, uh, of uh, strainer to, to mm -hmm. find the nuggets. But I tell you, you can't show me a player that's plus 59 and tell me he's not any good. Yeah. <laughs> he's outscoring big time when he's on the ice, you know. Emery Edge, wasn't he a great player with the Montreal Maroons, the coach, <laughs> the, the co coach by uh, Lord Avco? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, their, their briefly uh, sponsored, uh, they were a razor company, weren't they? And yeah. Emery we're, Edge we're, was the uh, award that they gave to the league's plus minus leader for about four years. And the first winner was Charlie Huddy. I guess, I guess in its own way, like the Stanley Cup, like the, the, the power structure of society then was these lords had a lot of power, right? Lord Stanley, I don't, I don't know who he was in particular, but but they had a lot of power, and and I guess in the 1980s it shifted to the corporations, and it was so there, there's a certain yeah. kind of symmetry to naming, 
you know, naming awards after these uh, powerful entities in society. So, but it still buildings. strikes me as utterly ridiculous to have a <laughs> an award named after a corporation. But the the World Hockey Association with the Avco Cup yeah, yeah. took the cake. Is there even an <laughs> Avco? I don't think the Avco exists anymore. It was a, like it was a company that would consolidate your loans, right? And yeah, pay them were... for you at an exorbitant, <laughs> exorbitant uh, mm. price, as I recall. Loan Sharks RS. Yeah. I got to plug in my battery here. Uh, Bruce? Um, yeah. Where are we? There we go. What is your uh, bad thing? My bad thing is just an observation of how I thought slow orders looked for big chunks of this game. Uh, they they were losing races to pucks over and over again. There would be puck in their own end. There'd be three Oilers there and one Hab, and the Hab would come away with it because they they would slow react. They would take the overland route to the puck. They would not have listened to the Walter Gretzky lesson: go where the puck's going to go, not where it's, you know. But also, just when they're rushing up the ice, everything just seems so slow and deliberate. I said to my wife at one time, it looks like they're just driving a bunch of Zambonis up there through the neutral zone. They just had no sort of team speed. And I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later in terms of the makeup of the roster right now. But when you look at the guys that they've added, Perry and Carrick and, and Henrique, um, and tonight they put Derek Ryan in the lineup instead of uh, Connor Brown. And, you know, there's not a lot of speed in any of those legs. And they got a few, like, super-duper speedsters, of course, McDavid being the obvious and the cloud being the real standouts. And they got other guys that can skate. But I just didn't feel like they really had their legs into this game. And, and frankly, I think Edmonton was very lucky to win this game, even though the stats will say they had the better chances and so on. I thought they were the second best um, on the puck for a lot of the game, and, and lack of speed had something to do with that. It, it is an issue, Bruce. Obviously, on this team, they they have they they are the, one of the oldest teams. And aside from a few players, they're one of the slower teams now because they have a lot of guys who don't move too fast. Um, you know, fortunately, they have a couple guys on the farm in Holloway and Broberg, who I think are NHL ready. I think we need to see them, and the sooner the better, honestly. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing Kulak get a shot on the right side. I think uh, he's earned a promotion into the top four. He's not going to get it with Nurse and Ekholm there. But um, he was killing penalties on the right side. He looked good. Kulak's having a great year. Um, and um, move him to the top four and bring in Broberg on the left side to bring in some added skating ability, speed and agility on the back end and bring up Dylan Holloway and play him. I just, uh, the Colorado game, it struck me then. Yeah. Colorado was creating all kinds of odd man rushes, uh, yes. rushes out of nothing because the Oilers couldn't keep pace with them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, Montreal looked fast too compared to the Oilers. In, in, yep. um, so uh, it's a, this is a problem and they, you know, I don't know who they'll sit. Um, but they're gonna they gotta figure this out because they need more speed on this team. And um I think that's becoming apparent to everybody, honestly. <laughs> My bad thing, Bruce, was the second goal, the tying goal. It was a four on four situation, which the orders almost often screw up. I don't know how much they get maybe it's just my imagination, but my or maybe just remember the bad things, but they get scored on a lot four on four. And it's because they start to freelance and they're not careful on defense and they get caught on odd man rushes a lot. And this time I think it was Nurse. So Bouchard and Nurse were were the defensemen out there and they wanted the two two offensive guys, I guess. And and um, um the, they lined up for the faceoff in their own zone on their opposite sides. And in the ensuing play, they rushed up the ice and Nurse rushed up the ice. Um, he was playing right side defense and he rushed up the ice and he joined the play. And then when he came back, he came back through the middle of the ice and there was never a really clear replay of this, but it was evident from the little bit of the replay that we, that we did see as the puck is Montreal was counterattacking up the ice after Edmonton's rush nurse comes from the right side and Bouchard's way over on the left side, still on his side of the ice nurse comes from his side, the right side to try to either make a play I think it's probably to make a play, force the play in the middle of the ice, which is a bad read. 
there's no there's no real danger on this rush until he makes his move. He he makes his move and he and suddenly the whole right side of the ice is open. Bouchard doesn't have time to switch over there because of Nurse's dramatic shift to the center of the ice to his side. And Caden Gooley has the entire right side of the ice to excuse me, left side of the ice. Am I screwing this up? Depends on which vantage point you want to. If, if you're looking at it from the Oilers defense mm-hmm. side, yeah, from the right side. Gooley's streaming down that wing and just fires the puck past the goalie. And it's because I think Darnell Nurse has made a bat poor read and um, moved into the center of the ice and lost his position. And it happens a lot, four on four, and it happened again. Yeah, Gooley just steamed in there and there was nobody near him. It's like the left defenseman from the other team has got like essentially a breakaway. Yeah. And he just blew a shot right through Pickard. Like it didn't did. particularly pick the corner. It just was a hard shot and it found a hole. And bang. He slammed it. Yeah, it yeah, was, it was I think it was a great A shot. I mean, yeah, he oh, was yeah. right in there. Yeah. He was I mean, flying and he was, it was like I say, like a breakaway. So. So a lot of people I suspect would blame Bouchard because they think he's the right D, so he should be yep. over there. So I, I'm sure online there's all kinds of people. But I think if you look at it again, and I watched this play a, a number of times to try to figure out what the hell happened. And it's mm-hmm. not, again, we never did get the full replay to tell us for sure. But I'm pretty sure Bouchard and Nurse had switched sides. Bouchard was on on um, the left side and Nurse was on the right. And Nurse moved to the middle and opened up his side of the ice completely. So, I mean, yeah. there's haters for both those players on the internet, yeah. like oh, yeah. big factions who some hate Nurse and then some hate Bouchard and some hate both. Yeah. Actually, but it's actually kind of factionalized. There's a Bouchard camp and a Nurse camp, and they don't... Well, they're very different they players. They don't so really the, cross... Set, like, like, those are yeah, two the different... Venn di- the Venn diagram, Venn diagram are, doesn't have a lot of intersection on yeah, that one. Yeah. What we try to do is not hate any player but just try to call each play accurately and figure out what yeah. happened on each play. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I saw that one. I, I saw it as nurse to blame and not Bouchard. Well, he's the primary culprit. I would have to agree, but yeah. And they asked Knobloch about it in the post game. And he's, uh, he, he said that, you know, they were, you know, they just kind of got their wires crossed in the neutral zone. And, You've got to and communicate. I can't remember exactly, you know, what they that that did come up. That sort of how was there all that open ice on that far side away from the bench? Good you question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even come on, even in beer league hockey, people say, okay, <laughs> switch. You know, it's just yeah. one word. Mm-hmm. It's it's not like okay, um, yeah. let's let's figure this out now. Who's going to cover it? With, let's just switch. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're going to switch, and if, as Nurse was doing, you you yell that out, and the other guy goes. And Bouchard was starting to go when he realized what was yeah. happening, but it was too late mm-hmm. by then. Yeah, well, Bouchard is uh, he's getting better, but his his um, urgency is sometimes not readily apparent. Yeah, he's one of the guys, Bruce, who last year in the playoffs had a rough playoffs defensively. You know, there's a few players that, that do have to pick it up this playoff season who, who haven't mm-hmm. done that well in recent years. Bouchard's defense has been lacking, and he's got to pick it up. Nugent Hopkins, has got to, he's another guy who's got to pick it up. There's a few of them who just haven't had a, the impact you'd like um, one way or another in the playoffs. So we'll see what happens. What's your number, Bruce? Yeah, well, I got two numbers, but they're very closely related. Uh, those numbers are 50 and 65. And those both relate to Evan Bouchard, who scored tonight uh, his 50th assist of the season, which together with the 15 goals he scored much earlier, it seems like, since the last time he scored, uh, gives him 65 points on the season. And he has joined uh, a pair of... Uh, otherwise exclusive clubs on the Edmonton Oilers to make that milestone. The only other guy to hit 50 assists in a season, Paul Coffey, who did it on a mere six occasions, including 90 assists at at the high, 86 and 84 the two years before that. He had 260 assists in three years, Paul Coffey. And uh, for six straight years, he was at 50, 50 plus and as for the 65, it's been done six previous times in Oilers history, also all by Paul Coffey. 
led by the ridiculous 138 points he scored from the defense position in 1985-86, when in addition to his 90 goals, he set an all-time NHL record still standing for goals by his defenseman with 48, in addition to his 90 assists, I should yes, say. Yeah. And so 138 points, but also 126, 121. You know, Bush has still got a little climbing to do to get up into that territory. Uh, but that said, you know, he's now tied for fifth with uh, uh, his close uh, contemporary, Noah Dobson, at 65 points. And he has cracked milestones that were the closest Euler D-man to either of those milestones before, or wait for it, Risto Siltonen. 1981-82, who had 48 assists and 63 points. And he was, before this year, the only artist D-man not named Coffey to hit 60 points. And, of course, he didn't get to 65. So now Bush has kind of, kind of, you know, joined some pretty heady. I mean, he's had a Risto Silton, and, you know, that's some pretty. Well, he was <laughs> Silton, and you may recall this, is, was my favorite player. I loved Silton. For a while there. He was such a fantastic <laughs> skater. I always felt he got the short shrift in Edmonton. He never got his due. I mean, he would have been, a, if, if there was Twitter then, man, there would have been a strong Silton in camp, but a strong anti-Silton in yeah, camp, probably. too, because he was one of those kind of players. He was like this 5'8", 200-pound Finnish player. Yeah, he yeah, he was a firefighter. He could what hammer a the hockey he puck oh. and skate. Oh, that guy could skate. Very but he stocky, made, but he very... Was a little, he made some defensive mistakes too, or probably for completely honest. So, yeah, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the year he got 63 points, which was 1981 82, the Gretzky's 92 goal season, he wow. only played 63 games. He had a point a game that year. He missed a bunch of time with injury and he still hit over 60 points. Like, and then they traded him that summer for Ken Linsman. For Linsman. Risto Siltonen. So Bush may, you know, he'll get into the 70s if he doesn't get hurt, and he'll get in maybe into the 80s. So that that would be uh, yeah, he's having four, a I mean, 65 season. points, 66 games. He's right on pace for 80, you know, because yeah. he hasn't missed any time, and he just keeps uh, he keeps uh, piling them up. Just tonight, just the secondary assist, and I wouldn't say it's his best game, but uh, because of the, you know, the very specific milestone, 50 assists, you know, second Oiler ever to do it, hey. That's going to be my I was, Yeah, I was surprised to hear he had that many. That was fantastic. Uh, Bruce, I was going to go with my number eight out of 20. So the Oilers had uh, 20 grade A shots. McDavid had eight of them. He was all over this game. He, he was he eight was, off of his stick. Like eight off of shooter? his stick. Four on the power play, four at even strength. So he was flying. But I was looking up Calvin Pickard's um, safe percentage. And if you go uh, with NHL goalies who have played more than 10 games this year, which gives you a, I think that's kind of a minimum to start counting their save percentage at this point. Um, four, my number is four out of five. There's four out of the five, four out of the five goalies with the top save percentage in the NHL this year who have played 10 or more games this year are former Edmonton Oilers. Four out of the five. Number one, Lorraine Brassois, 927. Wow. Number two, Anthony Stellars, 21 games for Florida, a 925 save percentage. Wow. Calvin Pickard, 919. And number Cam three? Talbot, four. Oh, number four. Connor Who's Hellebuck's number three, number three 923. Oh, okay. He's the beast. And yeah. Cam Talbot, in 43 games, is a 917 yeah. save percentage. Yeah. So, four. I just, when I saw that, I just was like, what? This is the goaltending factory, Bruce. Of the NHL. Uh, they're all former Oilers, eh? Brassois yeah. was here, Stellars was here, Pickard's yeah. here now. Talbot. Talbot was so, here, yeah, four out of the top five, eh? Amazing. Wow, goaltending factory is right. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, f to be fair, f three of them are backup, backup. goalies. And L.A. was looking at replacing Cam Talbot, look, desperately looking to replace Cam Talbot. At the trade deadline, although in 43 games, he does have a 917 save percentage. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's been up and down, obviously, this year, Cam Talbot. Um, but um, that's kind of a, I just, the Stolars, I don't think, played a game. Did he play a game for the others? One game, maybe? He played, yeah, I think he might have played at the very end of the season. Yeah. It was ridiculous. They traded Talbot for Stolars. 
just because they needed to legalize cap space because someone was coming off of LTIR and they didn't have any cap space. So Keith Gretzky, this was the year after same season, Shirelli got fired, but later in the season. So Keith Gretzky traded Talbot to a, you know, a contending team and they got Stolarz back as sort of, you know, uh, a rent a goalie uh, in the short term. And Koskinen, who in Shirelli's very last act, he signed Koskinen to this uh, to this uh, three-year, four and a half million dollar contract in January when he had these two goalies fighting for one job, and he he resolved the issue, and then he got fired. So Ken Hitchcock was the coach, and he didn't trust Stolarz, so he played um, he played uh, uh, Koskinen. 12 games in a row he started and then Costner got sick he missed one game against Toronto and Stolarz came in played pretty well lost the game and then Hitchcock goes right back to Costner for 12 more games in a row and uh, sort of a lost season that was going nowhere and they never even really looked at Stolarz I think he got like one start right at the end six and, games he played in total yeah, that many, in eh? six games 239 minutes in six yeah, games, more like 897 games. save percentage. How many starts? I don't know. Doesn't How many say. decisions have one loss record? Probably four, right? Um, zero and two. Zero oh, wins, wow. two losses. Wow. Yeah, because he was, you know, sort of a garbage time. They'd bring him in or something, but they did not want to even give him a look. It was really quite shocking given the team was going nowhere. But uh, anyway, that was uh, Stolar's experience. So those two Winnipeg Jets goalies, Bruce, with high save percentages, Boisois and Hellebuck, that team um, is underrated. That team is obviously has fantastic defensive structure right now. With you have two goalies in the top safe with save percentages like that. Watch out for the Winnipeg Jets because. Um, they're obviously doing something right, and they added some scoring into Monaghan and Toffoli. So that, I'm glad they're going to be beating up on each other in the uh, Central Division with Colorado and Dallas. Like, just hammer away, boys. Hopefully Vegas will end up over there, too. That would be fantastic. And um, beat up on each other like no divisions ever beat up on each other before before you get to the semifinal. Um, go ahead. I'm smiling because Tampa Bay beat uh, Vegas 5-3. Oh, if they finish fourth, do they for sure go over to the other side? Is that how it works? No, do you, no oh, you it's don't. just the, the lowest second wild card plays the top seed. Oh, So, so whichever that's... division champion has the most points oh. gets wild card number two. And the other so division if Vancouver champion, finishes first, and yeah. then we'll get... Okay. So it's just and kind if of a Vegas is a eighth and they'll get Vancouver. And if if Vegas is seventh, they'll get whoever wins in the central, which is very much up for grabs. <laughs> Let's call it Colorado. But it could be Winnipeg. Could be Dallas. There's no That's real weak lot. touches, soft touches in the Western Conference playoffs. You're gonna to have to beat at least two really strong teams to get out of the West. Oh, it's so tight right now. Vancouver, 94 points. Winnipeg, 93. Colorado, 93. Dallas, 91. So, And the Oilers are, uh, with three games in hand, they are eight points back of the Canucks. I guess the Canucks just won a game. Here's the bad news. Nikita Kucherov scored the empty net goal again to wrap up a four-point night and extend Ooh. his... his uh, Cooch. lead over McDavid in the scoring race. And it's so uh, these guys are not letting up Kucherov. It seems like no. he scored 15 points in the last week. Like he had a five oh, or five point game. And he, he's just been piling them in. So ah, good for him. Yep. Oh, he's They're, a great player. Yeah. Empty net goals. Not my favorite, but uh, that knife cuts both ways too. Yeah. So the Predators are just two points back of the Oilers, but the Oilers have three games in hand. Um, Predators with 84 points, the Oilers with 86. And the Kings have 81. I don't know if they've won their game yet. Yeah, they won. Of, they beat Chicago 6-2. I don't know if that's in the standings yet, but they're two right. points up. Anyway, right. Bruce, uh, let's move on to our conundrum. The conundrum is the Oilers shifted up their line significantly tonight. Mm. 
And what do we make of those? What do we make of those lines? What do you make of them? Well, I could at least understand what they were what they were trying to do. Uh, moving Evander Kane up to the McDavid Hyman line, and that's a pretty obvious attempt by uh, Coach Knobloch to see, shake the Evander Kane tree and see if a goal will fall out of it. He's now up to, after tonight, 14 games without a goal. He's been stuck on 21 since the Arizona game at Little Mullet Arena there a month ago. And he's been all around it, you know, like he's come, a lot of games he's had at least one great chance, you know, a good shot or he's hit a post like he did last game. And tonight, you know, uh, he wasn't bad. Uh, Kane, he had four shots on net. Uh, seven shot attempts. He has three hits. He was, uh, uh, according to Natural Stat Trick, he was on the ice for six high danger chances for Edmonton and zero against. And so, I mean, you watch him closely, you're going to almost certain to see a defensive mistake or another, you know, once in a while. He's not a real sound defensive player. He's more of a chaos swinger, right? But um, uh, tonight, I mean, you might say, did he drag down the McDavid line by him being there instead of Nugent? I'm not sure I would say that he did. I thought he was okay. I thought he was good. I didn't mind that. I, I, And I think in the playoffs, this might make the most sense. Um, you probably... Kane is playing well enough with the puck, making enough plays with the puck to play in the top six, I think. He shook off a fairly... Like, there's been some iffy moments start of the year, especially where we're wondering, like, is this guy's game done? But no, he's he's shown enough with the puck. Um, and in the playoffs, his ferocity will, will be important. His toughness will be important. Players get nasty in the playoffs. It's important to have a nasty player on the ice with McDavid. Him and Hyman and Kane, that could work. Um, Nuge tends to fade in the playoffs. He has for a couple of years in a row. Now that may change. Players can suddenly turn that around. But um, I like that line. And I think that was a really good idea. I think that was a good thing to try. So I think Knobloch, Knob, Knobloch got that right. And Kane did make a nice play on McDavid's goal, freezing off a player, a uh, Montreal defenseman, from being able to attack McDavid as McDavid made that incredible move in the first goal of the game at the net uh, where he deked suddenly deep back into the middle of the ice and put it around the goalie. Um, the second line, we have Dreisaitl with McLeod and Fogel. We've seen that for a while. This is uh, didn't have a great game tonight, but this is a good line, I think. it. Um, Fogel and McLeod are both um, responsible defensive hockey players, and they're both really fast. They open up space for Dreisaitl to make plays. They cover some defensive deficiencies with their speed and their conscientiousness for Dreisaitl, who can lapse on defense. Kane and Dreisaitl together is a nightmare, if you ask me. They have two players who have, who have fabulous... Dreisaitl is a fabulous attacking hockey player, one of the very best in the world. But if you have Kane and Dreisaitl together, you're going to have defensive lapses, which are going to cost you. So I don't see that working uh, as a line, as, a, as the heart of a line. But Fogel, McLeod, and Dreisaitl re- works really well. And I actually like this third line, too. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to... Ryan may be the one sitting out if Holloway gets back in the lineup. Maybe it'll be Holloway, Henrik, and Nugent Hopkins. Because that would add a real dose of speed and physicality to that line. Henrik, I think, really is a smart player. Um, this is how, um, you know, people like McTavish in intermission talked about him tonight. And, and I've seen it, I've seen it watching him play defense. He's a good hockey player, defensively, very smart player. Nugent Hopkins is the same, um, extremely smart player, defensively conscientious, good with the puck. But I think both of them, if they're going to get stuff done on the attack, could really use a driving fast, driving hockey player to create some space mm-hmm. and room for them. Just like Fogel and McLeod do for Dreisaitl. Holloway could maybe do that for these two guys and they could Holloway has defensive deficiencies. So um, they could make up for that. Could be a good combination where they just, he just is a dog on the Holloway's a dog on the puck and then rushing the puck as fast as he can. And then these other two guys are smart making plays and covering for everybody out there. 
And then, then you have a lot of choice on the bottom line, you know, Yanmark, Carrick, Perry, Ryan, Gagne, um, and they, they can, and Connor Brown. So, so there's plenty of choices um, on the lower lines. Um, you know, there's a chance that Connor Brown mm -hmm. could be the driving player with Nugent Hopkins and Henrique. Anyway, I saw enough of that, that threesome, Bruce, that I'd like to see, see it again, maybe with a different player than Ryan, uh, who's too similar in some ways to, to Henrique and Nugent Hopkins. He's a smart, cerebral player, but not a real driver. He, he reads the game extremely well, but I, th I think they need a little bit more speed and aggression on that line to make it, to make it work. What did you think of that line? Yeah, well, they got smoked on um, um, possession. Like, uh, their, their course, he, um, Henrique was 30%, Nuge was 31 Mc, uh, Ryan was 25 So they spent a fair amount of time in their own. And, I mean, I'm talking like the Oilers got one shot on net when Ryan was on the ice, so two each for... Nuge and Henrique, and of course they scored a goal. Henrique scored the nice little tapping goal, so they came out of it smiling, you know, with uh, uh, on that. But then they were, I think, the line that got burned on the 2-1, uh, were they not? They were indeed. Henrique got a stick on the pass uh, into the slot, but it got it went through his stick, and then it went in. I think it actually went in off CC, went in off somebody. and CC's toe cap. Yeah, in. it was like a triple bouncer. It was yeah, that bad. was a tough goal against um, Kulak. Might have got a stick on it. It was just a tough play. Those goals against will happen. Yeah, so um, I mean, I mean, they didn't get caved in, Bruce, in, in terms of making mistakes on grade A shots. Um, other than that, Henrik uh, not cutting off that pass. They were all they were actually pretty good about that. They. So, so they whatever shots there were, I'm going to suggest they they generally speaking limited high danger shots at least that they were responsible for making mistakes on. They just they didn't do that. So sometimes those numbers can be a little bit um, misleading. I think Henrik's Corsi on the orders isn't good because it's a couple games in a row where yeah. he's been outshot. But I'm seeing it's a good smart player. I, I just think mm -hmm. they're going to need to figure out. I, again, I think they need they need. I, I would suggest Holloway. I think he's the right player. The right the uh the right guy or maybe it is brown but kane kane is not a checking like if you want a, a shutdown checking line you can't have evander kane on it it yeah. won't work he's not that's not his game not his game he's not gonna do it so um don't try but brown he, he'll try and nugent hopkins will try and henrik will try i mean that that or and holloway i think he, he'll try to he'll try too he'll 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 put his mind to it whether he succeeds or not i mean he's a rookie but again he brings a lot of energy and size and speed so wouldn't mind seeing that carrick i thought looked good that i saw him pretty well today i thought that was you know, he made some nice plays, I thought, and um, he, he got in that fight. He's, no, it was I don't a like, fight. I don't like, I'm not in, like, I just, like, we, guys get injured in fights. Mm -hmm. We've seen yeah. it a lot. Yeah. It seems like more so in the NHL. Well, they're, they're punching masks and helmets. Of course, they're going to hurt their hands now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a big fan of a nothing fight. And that's what struck that me, that struck me as kind of a nothing fight. So, but um, Carrick has a bit of game. Like he's not a he's not a fantastic player, but he oh. he might might be useful. I'm still get, trying to get a sense of him. Zero shot attempts tonight. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, yeah, Mark he did, Perry he did chip Perry. in on the penalty kill. Yeah, uh, two minutes twenty two seconds. Uh, only Nuge had more on the penalty kill tonight than. Uh, Carrick and Henrik was one second behind Carrick. So they're at least tonight, you know, Montreal had a couple chances on the power play, but no goals. And um, uh, those guys were okay on that unit. But the, the fourth line again, that, you know, they just didn't generate much. Yeah. Like they were outshot. 6-2 for when when Carrick was on the ice. It's just shots on goal this time. Or 9-2 in shot attempts. 
Yeah, yeah it's just very one side. But I just thought Montreal was faster and more aggressive and and urgent on the puck to win puck battles and in the corners and you know direct them towards the net. Even as we didn't see them as necessarily the greatest of chances, the fact is that on five on five in this game, uh, Montreal had more shot attempts than Edmonton in all three periods by you know three or four or five, and on the night 49 to 37 uh, at five on five that Montreal uh, and the pucks. There were stretches of the game, the second and third periods especially, where the puck didn't seem to get... When it did get out of Edmonton's... And it would get about as far as the face-off dot outside of Edmonton's blue line and go right back into the zone again. Like, Oilers couldn't get the damn thing to center for chunks of time in this game. And really, it was... Uh, yeah. I'm and not here's, a big... Here's forward lines. Now, granted... All three guys have to be on the ice for these to count. So they've only got 13, 20, or well, 35 minutes of the game accounted for. The Ryan line was on for one shot. Uh, the the uh, Carrick line for two shots. The Dry Saddle first star, Dry Saddle was on for one shot. So that's three of the four lines. Uh, when they're out there as lines, combined to get four shots on net. Yeah, the Dry Saddle line didn't get going this mcdavid game. line nine shots like they yeah. were the offensive driver and even oh. mcdavid he's following the puck a lot and he had a lot of pucks go nowhere but he just kept bringing stuff and making it happen and well eight grade a shots on that yeah yeah no i know i know that's not that's pretty like he wasn't good. on top of his game and even still he he created quite a bit yeah. for sure and, and yeah. uh, uh down the uh, down the stretch especially well, nice goal, when it came to grade goal. A shots, whatever it was in terms of shots at net, when it came to the best mm-hmm. shots, Edmonton dominated this game. And, it, and a lot of it came on the power play, of course, but they did do so. It was 22, what did I say, eight? Or something like that. By our count. So, like, it, Montreal was not able to get off a lot of good shots, and Edmonton was. So, um, Bruce, let's leave it there. What's the next game? Thursday night at home, end of the homestand against Buffalo Sabres. Ooh, revenge timing. Eh? Team that beat Edmonton in overtime or shootout. Uh, well, they beat him in overtime and the shootout, in my opinion. But uh, that was the one with the ch- the real oh, yeah. sleazy offside call when the boys were already down to their ginch in the room, as one of the players said, because they, were, they thought they'd lost and they were just hitting the showers and getting out of dodge. And then they got told the game wasn't over yet. They lost it, and uh, they lost the plot in that game. Uh, much as they lost it, I thought tonight, you know. But yeah, uh, they they need to uh, uh, they need to uh, adjust their sights a little bit, and uh, and then of course right after that Saturday in Toronto. So that'll be a game. That'll be a big game for all of the Toronto boys on the Oilers, and there yeah. are many of them. Some, you know. In some ways, yeah, we'll see. You know, can you turn it off and on? One thing you don't want to see is a team burn itself out mm-hmm, in the final 20 games of the year. And the yeah. owners aren't doing that. Like, they're not mm-hmm. hitting. They're not playing a hitting game. Yeah. So they're trying to stay healthy. And they're playing to, trying to play an intense game, a smart positional game, a sound game where they're not giving up great A shots. And generally, they're achieving mm-hmm. that. They're just, they're not really putting their pedal foot to the pedal and going for it. So I don't know how to think about it. Um, maybe it's a veterans, a smart veteran team, knowing what this game means, not a whole hell of a lot, and just let's get through it. Let's play smart. Let's get the win and let's move on. And in that in that regard, I'm okay with it. Well, they eventually got the win, but they sure made it hard on themselves. They did. So. Anyways, uh, uh, in general, I approve of what um, Knobloch did tonight in terms of getting the guys into the lineup that have been up in the press box a while, getting Ryan in there, getting Stetcher in there, getting Pickard back in there, you know, and and, and I've been saying since the beginning, when you've got all these extra forwards, rotate them and get them all in and out of there, and uh, that's, what, uh, that's what he did tonight, and I think 
down the stretch, they should continue to stick to that. Yeah, sit Jan Mark a game, sit Ryan a game, sure. sit Brown a game, sit Corey Perry a game. Absolutely. And um, Carrick, like these guys, mm -hmm. just rotate them and yeah. see what happens. All right, Bruce, let's leave it, leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.